morning, church. Welcome to church. Take a moment. Let's welcome Bridgeport, Middletown, Hartford. Can we just put our hands together, church? We love you. God bless you. Honored, privileged to see all that God is doing across our region at the various locations that we have and thankful, thankful for what the Holy Spirit is doing that we all get to be a part of it. So if you're new to City Church, glad you're here. My name is Justin. I'm the lead pastor here. Good morning. And uh, you made it out on 4th of July weekend, so you are definitely holier than the rest. Uh, clearly, God has his hand of favor on you, and you have earned points with your creator. So, uh, just kidding. Well done. Just kidding. We've been in a teaching series called Us, right? And if you've been with us, it's been an important series for our church. We're looking at the distinctives of City Church. Years ago, we outlined seven core distinctives that describe or articulate our culture here as a church. Every group of people, every community has a culture, right? And so it's crucial that as we continue to grow in our faith and in our numbers, that we understand the culture of this community, who we are and how we are, right? And so we've been looking at various different things. We started with this idea that we're married to the message, that we are deeply committed to the truth that leaders serve, that it's how low you can go, not how high you can go, that Jesus looks for in our hearts. He wants us to be people that serve. We talked about that. We talked about what it means to be a contender, what it means to be a person that believes for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done. We talked about pioneering, right? Do you remember this? That pioneering spirit. And, uh, and so we've been covering all of our uh, distinctives. This is week five. Week five of our distinctives. There's seven. So we've got next week, the week after that. And we're going to be today in Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah 26, if you have a Bible, uh, the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. Chapter 26, starting in verse 1, will be the text we'll focus on for the majority of the morning. It says this, In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Somebody came to church just for that verse, by the way. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. He has humbled the inhabitants of the height, the lofty city. He lays it low, lays it low to the ground, casts it to the dust. Fifth distinctive here at City Church, if you want to jot it down, we thrive in cultural centers. We thrive as a church in cultural centers. What we're going to be looking at today is more of the strategy of our church. Why we operate the way we operate. We thrive in cultural centers. Would you bow your head and pray with me and ask God to speak to each of us today. God in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that have gathered in Middletown and Bridgeport and Hartford here in New Haven. Jesus, thank you that that Middletown property is going to get done this week. and We're going to move in by God's grace in Jesus' name, on next Sunday. And so, Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing here. I thank you for the work of God in North Campus and all that's happening there, even this morning. Jesus, as we gather to seek your face, I pray that your kingdom would come among us. I pray that you speak to us and that you meet us. Meet me, God. Let's just make it personal. Meet me, Lord. Open my eyes to your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Did you know that 200 years ago, 5% of the world's population lived in a city. 200 years ago, 5% of the world's population lived in a city. Today, over 50% of the human race lives in an urban area, lives in a city. So we are experiencing, whether we realize it or not, because sometimes in the midst of something we don't grasp it or see it, we are experiencing really the greatest social transition in the history of the human race. They say that by 2030, experts tell us, 80% of the human race will exist in an urban center, live in a city. One uh, journalist, Doug Saunders, said that we will end this century as a completely urban species. It's amazing how transitional these last 200 years have been. Right now, the economic engine of the world 
is in the city. In the, in the United States of America, for example, more than 90% of the economic output of the United States comes from our cities. And so the vast majority of what we're putting out is coming from cities. If you took the 10 largest mega cities on planet Earth, they make up about 6.5% of the world's population and 43% of the world's economic output just from 10 places. So the vast majority of economic output on the Earth is coming from cities, but it's not just an economic factory, right? Cities are a culture factory. And so if you want to see a great show or go to the theater or watch, you know, some great performance or see your favorite musical group, you're most likely going into a city to see it because cities are hubs for culture. They create culture and they also disproportionately attract young people, right? They disproportionately attract the social elites of the world. And the stranger from another land often ends up in a city. And the poor often end up in cities. And so cities are this melting pot where you can find people that you can't find anywhere else in the world. And there are good things and bad things about this massive migration into the city, right? There are things that are positive and there are things that are negative. Time magazine tells us, that in the last two years, violent crime in the United States, in its major cities, has been on the rise. And so a city is oftentimes the place where you can find atrocities like human trafficking or prostitution, drugs or homelessness. Things that we want to see solved in our land often exist in their strongest form in the city. And so we can say there are good things and there are bad things about the human race migrating into cities... But one thing we must say, and this is important, church, one thing we must say as followers of God, that this transition in human history is a God thing. God is in the middle of it. And so God is the architect of our history. He knows all the plans that he has for the human race. And he has been shaping and forming humanity for a particular purpose. And he has intentionally permitted the course of humanity to come to this place. We are living in a time in history like no other. Now, in the garden, God says to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, right? He says, be fruitful and, and multiply. And then he says, fill the earth and subdue it. He says, subdue it, subdue the earth. And so many theologians have called this the cultural mandate. We are called to subdue the earth or take the raw materials of life, the raw materials around us, and maximize them for human flourishing. That is the essence of the command of God for humanity. Take the raw materials of life and maximize those materials for human flourishing. Now God, in his design of the earth and of our race, put within people an exponential potential when they live in proximity so when people exist in close proximity god has designed it in such a way that greater opportunity can be achieved that greater safety can be achieved that greater creativity can be achieved and so god in his forming of the human race put this proximity power inside of us that when people come close when people stay close there is higher potential for creativity higher potential for opportunity and higher potential for human safety right and so this is what we find as the building block of the city so in the history of humanity People realize that, hey, we can be safer if we're together. We build some walls, we build a city, it's safer than being out there on your own. And there's more opportunities one to another because in a collective proximity, when we're close to each other, different opportunities open up that wouldn't, op that wouldn't open up if we were all spread out. And when we're all close together, not just opportunities, but there's this creative thing that happens. You have one idea and I have another and those ideas come together and they create something better. And so we saw from early on in our race that there was a power hidden within the urban environment. It didn't take long, though, in the history of our race for that power to be distorted by sin. And so with a fractured identity that comes from sin, human beings did something specific. They started to build a new city. Genesis chapter 11, just 11, verse, or 11 chapters into the book, we get a picture of the new city that the human race has been building ever since. It says this, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Somebody say ourselves. 
a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And so people, this is the Tower of Babel story, if you know the scriptures, the people gathered together and they said, okay, here's what we got to do. If we're going to protect ourselves and benefit ourselves for the sake of ourselves, we want to use the safety, the opportunity, the creativity that comes through proximity, not to glorify God or to honor him, but instead to exalt self. And that city's been growing ever since. And so we see in the scripture, and this is important, that there is an, an allegory going on from Genesis to Revelation. There is a picture that God is painting. And a city is not just a geographical location, okay? A city is a way of life, a way of thinking, a social order. That's what a city is. And so when sin inclines the heart to begin to build something for ourselves, it develops into what I think St. Augustine was the first to call it, the city of man. And if you want to jot notes down, you can. The city of man is built on one fundamental idea, and that is self-salvation. Self-salvation. How can I save, promote, exalt myself? And of course, this city is pictured all through the Bible. If you read the Bible in this context, you start to see that this city appears and reappears again and again in Nineveh, in Sodom, in Babylon, in Persia, in Rome, a city or a people collectively close in proximity, maximizing that proximity for pride, for self-exaltation, for personal promotion. And of course, ultimately, even Jerusalem, God's holy city in the scriptures, becomes the city of man. When Jesus is brought into the city, celebrated and worshipped as the Messiah, he is quickly then betrayed, right? And it's Pontius Pilate, the overseer of the Roman officials within that city, who trades a righteous man. He gives up justice for the crowd's appeasement, right? And so he says, you know what, it's better to appease the crowd than it is to pursue justice. And there is the city of man. And then it's the Pharisees, the religious leaders, who trade a godly leader, Jesus, for the power and control control of the populace. And so we see even Jerusalem becomes the city of man. It becomes a place where people are seeking self-exaltation over God exaltation. And if you're honest today, whether you're 15 or 52 or 65 or 41, you're here today, you can say that probably the greatest struggle of your life, if you see it in this context, has been with the city of man in your own heart. The city of man tries to live inside each of us. It's that thing inside you that longs to promote yourself. That thing inside you that longs to be recognized, to be celebrated. That when you get around a group of people, you just find a way to mention the important people you know in the conversation so that others look at you with a higher level. If you examine your own heart long enough, you will find it an honest reflection that the city of man has frequently found its towers within your own heart. That craving to self-exalt, to self-promote, ultimately the belief that I can save myself by proving myself. In Isaiah, he tells us what happens to the lofty city. The prophet Isaiah sees this tension and he outlines it for us. He says there's the city of God, there's the city of man, and he outlines the city of man, and look at what he says will happen to that city in verse 5. It says, for he, and that's God, has humbled the inhabitants of the height. He calls it, look, the lofty city. He lays it low, lays it low to the ground, casts it to the dust. In other words, what he's telling us is, this city that is built on self-exaltation and self-salvation will ultimately crumble will ultimately fall, that God will, in his sovereign plan, destroy the city that is built on self. And we see this in the book of Revelation at the end of the story. In Revelation 16, it's pictured as Babylon, okay, which was one of the physical cities that was represented by this pride, but becomes a picture of a spiritual city that lives in all of us. And it says this about Babylon. It says, the great city split into three parts. This is Revelation 16. And the cities and the nations collapsed, and God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of his fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. In Revelation 18, it says this about the city. It says, terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, your doom has come. And so we see in the scriptures, stay with me today. I know we're going deep, right? Go ahead and turn to your neighbor. Tell them we're going deep. Don't fall asleep, right? Right? We see today 
that this city that exists inside of us and exists within human structures and social orders of self-exaltation and self-salvation and pride will ultimately be destroyed and torn down. The day will come where those that have lived to satisfy self-interest will be exposed and will fall. And some will exist within the church, and some will exist within the business world, and some will exist among the rich, and some will exist among the poor. But God knows the heart of man, and he sees what city is being built, and he says, that city I will tear down. But in the midst of that city, God is now building another city. He is building a city to save humanity from the vacuum caused by sin, where we do not know our core identity. And in the work of God, we see now a building of a new city. And Isaiah tells us about it just before the verse in uh, verse 26, uh, chapter 26. He tells us about it in chapter 25. Look what he says in verse 8 of 25. It says, he, speaking of one who is to come, will swallow up death forever. And the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people will be taken away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. There's only one friend who has come to conquer death, who has washed away the tears of those that are broken, who has won the battle over death. And then it says in our verse, it says, in that day they will sing. In what day? In the day that the one who conquers death has come, okay? Okay. And so we see here that Jesus has prophesied 600 years before his birth that he would come and that in that day there would be a new song by a new city. And what is the song that the people who receive his grace will sing? It says this, we have a, what are the next words? We have a strong city. He, who's that? Jesus, sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. And for most of us, we go, yes, he sets up salvations as walls and bulwark. What's a bulwark? I don't know. Something called a bulwark. Yes, awesome. Walls and something else that has to do with castles that we don't know, right? Well, if you know much about the design of castles, what you know is that it had a wall around it, a city had a wall around it, and then it had a bulwark if it was a really strong city. And basically what a bulwark was, what a, was a second wall. It was a wall usually made of earth that was surrounding the wall that was made of stone. And so a protected city had a double wall. In other words, check it out, what Isaiah is saying is that God is going to introduce a salvation for his people that is like a double wall of protection for them because when Jesus came and died on the cross he washed away every sin you've ever committed from the day you were born to the day you die completely absolving you of sin so that you are not guilty permanently before God but he didn't stop there that was just one wall that he built in your salvation right after he built that wall he imputed to you his blameless spotless perfect record of righteousness so that when you stand before the father in heaven God does not just see you as forgiven he sees you as perfect because the record of his son has been given to you and that's a second wall of salvation. And so now, if you're a believer in Jesus, I got some really good news for you. You've got a double protected salvation. You have an ironclad bulletproof guarantee that you are saved because you've not just been forgiven, you've been made righteous. Those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in this life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So an impenetrable salvation. And then it says in verse two, look, it's describing the people of God. It says, open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. Now he's speaking in picture here, right? He's speaking in allegory. He says, open the gates. Well, what does that mean? In Revelation 21, the same phrase is used. It says this, it says, the gates of God's heavenly city, the gates never close. They stay open all day long and there is no night. In Hebrews chapter 4 it gives us a clarity about what this gate picture is it says this let us come boldly to the very throne of God and stay there I like that and stay there stay there to receive his mercy and find grace to help in our times of need in other words what he's saying is I'm not just built around these new people 
a double salvation, I've also given them unrestricted access to my presence. I have, they have unrestricted access. They can come boldly right to the throne of God based on the righteous record of Christ and speak to God and be heard as if Jesus himself spoke it. That's the picture of salvation that is painted here. And then he goes even further. Take a look in verse 3. It says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, interesting, in the Hebrew, that phrase perfect peace, they didn't have a word for perfect. And so if they wanted to emphasize something as perfect, they'd say the same word twice. And so it's a double word, okay? And so the word for peace is shalom. And if you know much about the Hebrew word shalom, it doesn't mean just an absence of war, okay? It means wholeness. It means nothing missing, nothing lacking. It means a place of completeness in God. And so he says there is a place for the believer, for those who have been delivered for the new city. There is an inward city that can be built with a double salvation within the heart, with unrestricted access to God. And then likewise, this peace that is absolutely perfect because it is not built on my own abilities. The city of self, the city of self-salvation and striving has been torn down and the city of Christ and his salvation has been built up and no longer do I need to strive to earn God's favor or approval instead I can fully rest no more proving no more grasping no more showing myself worthy I can rest in the accomplishments of Christ and it's in that I've got perfect peace I've got perfect peace and so here church check this out here, Isaiah is prophesying a new society, a new social order, a people who live with a different heart, a people who don't live in the city of man, but a people who live not based on performance, not built on insecurity, but founded on the love of God, built on his grace and his mercy, chosen, beloved, forgiven, adopted, redeemed, his church. Augustine many years ago called it the city of God, the city of God, and the city of God is defined not by self-salvation, but by cruciform living, cruciform living, and that word cruciform might sound strange to you, it means a life shaped by the cross, a life that has been shaped around the cross. This is the strong city that Isaiah prophesies. He says there is a strong city coming. And many of us read this and hear this and you hear me talking, you go, amen, in the by and by it will come, right? When Jesus returns, when he comes back to planet Earth, we will establish this great city. And that is true, by the way. In the book of Revelation, the, uh, the angel brings John and he says, John, let me show you the bride. Let me show you the church. Let me show you the city. And it's the same thing. And it says when he steps forward, he sees the new Jerusalem, it's called. These are all pictures. It's an all allegorical picture. There's a new Jerusalem that comes and it is the people of God. It is God's people, the city. And it comes upon the earth earth in this last day and so we say yeah this is for another day but it's also at the same time the city that is already here see when Matthew in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus gave his most famous sermon the sermon on the mount he looked out at the people of God his disciples and he said this to him look at it in Matthew 5 you've heard it before he says you are the world's light and he picked his words carefully look what he says next you are the world's light a what? Oh, that's weird that he would say that, right? A city on a hill glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light. Let it shine for all. Let your good deeds glow for all to see so that they will praise your heavenly Father. And so we see here the overlap of ages. We see that in God's sovereign plan, he has already established the city of God in the hearts of the believers. And there will be a day in the consummation of the ages where Christ returns and we see the fullness of that established with our eyes. But today, that city lives within the heart of every believer and notice what he says we are supposed to do he doesn't say therefore since a new city lives within you buy a big piece of property and set up your own city next to the evil city of man 
That's not what he says, right? And he doesn't say, therefore, since the city of God lives within you, be within the city of man and be invisible so that no one will ever see you or recognize you. No, no, no. That's not what he says. Instead, he says, my strategy for the overlap of the ages, for the now that we live in, my strategy for the earth is that we would see the city of God manifest in the city of man. Don't hide your light, but let your good deeds glow. In other words, live the cruciform life, a life shaped by the cross in the city of man. And so we see God's strategy for the age of the church. And it's this, you can jot it down. Plant the city to come within the city that is to bring the city to life. Plant the city to come that's the work of God in the heart of the Christian. That believer, plant the city to come, that's the church, within the city that is, that's the broken structures of the human race in which we currently exist, to see the city come to life. In other words, leverage the God-given power of proximity, okay? Leverage the God-given power of proximity. Some of you are, I'm going a little bit fast today, stay with me. Leverage the God-given power of proximity. God has put a supernatural power when people are close. When lots of people are gathered together, it increases opportunity, it increases creativity, and it increases the potential for safety. And yet in the city of man, we haven't seen opportunity, we've seen oppression. We haven't seen safety, we've seen crime. And yet what we see is that God has still wedged that supernatural potential within people living in close proximity. And so God says, my plan is to radiate from population centers. My plan is to plant the city that is to come within the city that is to bring that city back to life. And so, listen, we love the suburbs here at City Church. By the way, this is a big piece of who we are, why we are City Church, right? We love the suburbs, we love every suburb, every town, we believe that every single human being has intrinsic worth from God, and we want to reach every person with God's love. And yet there's a particular strategy that we believe is from the Lord for us. Tim Keller, one great preacher, said it like this, he said, you can't reach the city from the suburbs, but you can reach the suburbs from the city. Cities are like a giant heart, drawing people in and sending them out, drawing people in and sending them out. So we see this strategy of planting the city to come within the city that is, to bring the city to life, we see this strategy play out in the New Testament, okay? We didn't make this up. This was a strategy given to the disciples to reach the region. And so if you know much about the early church, you've read the book of Acts, a small handful of followers of Jesus, 120, stay in Jerusalem, which was the major religious center of the day at the time in Israel, and begin sharing Christ and preaching Christ. In one day, uh, Peter sees 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus, and the church is born, and things start to grow. Now, from that religious center of Israel, where does the church go next? Persecution comes, and we read in the Bible that the church goes to every little small town and village, that they go to every little farming community, right? Is that what it says? No, it's actually not what it says. Is that what it says? It says they set up a base in Antioch, that the next big place the church finds its foundation is in Antioch. Now, Antioch wasn't a little, you know, country town by the bay. Antioch in that day was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It was strategically chosen by the disciples because of its influence. And then from Jerusalem and Antioch, they had two major hubs in two of the major cultural centers of the world. And then from there, they started spreading out. Again, did they go to towns and villages first? No, no, they got to all the towns and villages by God's grace, but they had a strategy in mind. They said, God has called us to plant the city that is to come within the city that is to bring the city to life. And then from that, like a pounding heart, radiate from these cultural centers so that we can reach every part of the region. And so from there you see them in Corinth. Now Corinth at the time was a maritime city. It had two crucial seaports that could send you all over the world. Corinth was famous for its visitors. And so in the city of Corinth, they're now influencing the entire region. But from Corinth they go to Ephesus, which was the commercial center of Asia. And then Philippi, and then Athens, and then Rome. If you were to read this list today, Day. It would read like New York and London and LA and Mumbai. It would be all the major cities of the first century. 
What we find, one historian said it like this. He said, within 20 years of the crucifixion, Christianity was transformed from a faith based in rural Galilee to an urban movement. Paul's missionary journeys took him to urban cities with only an occasional visit to smaller communities. No mention is made of him preaching in the countryside. John Stott, one great theologian and scholar, said, it seems to have been Paul's deliberate policy to move purposefully from one strategic city center to the next. Well, what was the result? I told you we're talking about strategy today. Everybody doing okay? You doing all right over here? Hartford, you doing okay? Everybody's doing good? Okay. We're talking about strategy today. What was the result of the New Testament church operating with this philosophy of planting the city to come within the city that is to bring the city to life? What was the result? Well, by A.D. 100, about 70 years after Jesus rose from the dead, there were 25,000 Christians. Which is a lot. I mean, if you think about going from 120 people to 25,000 in 75 years, that's pretty incredible. But that was just the beginning. Because if you know your history, by A.D. 310, just 200 years after the 25,000 Christians existed, there were 20 million Christians. And so something happened. Something exponential happened. How'd they do it? How did they see it come to pass? I'll tell you the secret. They said, we're going to plant the city that is within, the city to come within the city that is, to bring these cities to life. I found interesting, there was a letter written in A.D. 140. A.D. 140, it's known as the, the letter to Diagnatius. It's, it's a famous letter now if you study this time in history. It was written by someone, we're not sure exactly who, it was written to a government official about Christians within the city at this time. This is A.D. 140, okay? So it's just a one generation after Jesus walked the earth. And so it's written to them, and I just want to read a portion of it today. It says this about Christians. It says, Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in whether Greek or foreign and yet there is something extraordinary about their lives they live in their own countries as though they were only passing through they play their full role as citizens but labor under all the disability of aliens they share their meals but not their wives they pass their days upon the earth but they are citizens of heaven obedient to the laws they yet live on a level that transcends the law condemned because they are misunderstood they are put to death but raised to life again they live in poverty but they enrich many they are totally destitute but they possess an abundance of living to speak in general terms we may say that the christian is to the world what the soul is to the body as the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, so Christians are found in all the cities of the world but cannot be identified with the world. It is by the soul enclosed within the body that the body is held together. And similarly, it is by the Christians detained in the world that the world is held together. This was the New Testament picture of the church on the earth. And today... I want to encourage you and every one of our campuses to begin to catch a vision for what God is doing in New England right now. What he's doing in our day, in our time, in this land. There's a lot of other places you could live, by the way. I didn't know if you knew that. There's other places like San Diego in Jesus' name, right? There's other places like Dallas. There's other places like Fort Lauderdale. There's lots of other places you could go. The Barna Research Group found, this is 2017, just came out. They did a study of the most post-Christian cities in America. And of course, if you've been in New England, you've seen these studies before. Well, this one's fresh. It's new. It just came out this year. They studied the most post-Christian cities in America. What cities have walked furthest from the biblical idea of God and faith in Jesus Christ? Which cities are they? Well, of the top six, New England held five. Five of the top six, Hartford, New Haven, Boston, Providence, Manchester, Burlington, and Portland, all found themselves in the top ten. Guess what? Where was L.A.? Where was Las Vegas? Where was Chicago as a post-Christian city? Certainly they made the list somewhere down the list. But what I realized as I looked at this afresh, I saw Hartford, and I saw New Haven, and I saw Providence where we want to plant, and Boston, and on and on and on. You know what I realized? I realized that whether you like it or not, we are standing in the greatest opportunity in America. 
We are actually standing in the most needy region for spiritual awakening of anywhere on the earth. That's the truth. And what we find interesting about New England, like everywhere else in the earth, but certainly true of New England, when you look at the six states of New England, and you look at the 13 million plus people, what you find is that these people are clustered around cities, right? So go ahead and throw that population map of New England up there for me. If you see that population map, the red sections are the sections where there is the majority of people. And what you notice is though there's lots of geography in New England, what you find is that the vast majority of people are saturated right around the urban environments. Like we said, by 2030, 80% of the human race will live in an urban center. And so we see that this is likewise true of New England. Now, New England doesn't have tons of mega cities, but it is the most needy region of the earth. And so what caught our hearts five and a half years ago as we planned to prepare to launch City Church with 12 friends and a big dream, what caught our hearts is that we believe that if we could plant churches in the largest city centers of New England, we could reach the entire population of New England by his grace. And so we said if we plant in the 10 largest New England cities, we mapped it out, we would be 15 minutes away from over half of New England's population. And so we have that on a map where if we plant in those city centers, go ahead and throw that up there. If we plant in those 10 city centers, you'll see that the vast majority of the population of New England is covered by simply planting in those 10 places. Now those won't be the only places we plant, but those are strategic locations that we have opportunity to influence more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're saying, listen, in one lifetime, in one lifetime, is it possible to plant the city to come within the city that is and bring the cities to life? Is it possible? Is it possible to see New England move from the least church region in the United States to the most spiritually vibrant place on earth in one generation? Is it possible? And I'm convinced, church, I'm convinced that it is. As we plant the city to come within the city that is to bring the city to life. But we've got to notice something. In Isaiah chapter 26, when he talks about the lofty city and the strong city, speaking of the inner man that is outlined in a social order, that comes manifest in a social order, the lofty city is a life built on self-salvation, proving myself, glorifying myself, centering things around myself, doing what's best for myself. That's the city of man. And he contrasts it with the city of God, right? The city of God that is built on cruciform living. I know who I am in Christ. I discover my purpose in Christ. I live for Christ. There's this tension between the two. One is a strong city in God, and one is a lofty city that will be torn down. But I want, what I want you to see in Isaiah 26 is that when the prophet declares prophetically about the church of God, we have a strong city. He wasn't speaking about systems. He wasn't speaking about strategy. He wasn't saying we have a strong move of God's spirit because we have a good system. Or we have a strong move of God's spirit because we have a good organizational structure. Oh, city church, we've got a plan to plant in cities and that's going to be the way that we really reach New England. We're going to plant churches in cities and it's going to happen that way. No, 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 that's not the plan of God. The plan of God is not some particular system or strategy. He says that the strength of the strong city was in its revelation of who I am in Christ. It was a people with a new identity that were planted in the cities of this earth that brought the cities to life. See, it's not enough to have a strong church or a good structure or a nice organization. The real secret of transformation is in the living. It's in the life practices of you and me. You are the city of God. And so what does it mean? It means that you live your life in such a way that you embrace the double-walled protection of God's salvation for you. You know that you know that you know that he has saved you because there's a wall of righteousness that he has wrapped around within a wall of the washing away of your sins. And so you know that you're cleansed by your, from your sins and you know that God's given you his righteousness. And it's not a theological idea, it's a breathing reality. And so you talk to God like you have access, like the Bible says you have. And when you pray, it's not just, oh God, I hope, I wish. No, 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 you've got the revelation of who you are. You've got a new identity. You're a strong city. And you know in your core 
that you have access to God because of Christ. And so it creates in you a life of shalom, shalom, perfect peace, because your mind is stayed on him. See, when God describes the strong city, he doesn't say it's a strategic plan, even though there is a strategic plan. He says the real secret to the strong city is the lifestyle of authentic Christianity. That's the real secret. See, the strength of the church is found in the substance of the people. The strength of the church is not found in its plan, is not found in its worship, is not found in its organizational structures, is not found in its communication. The strength of the church is found in the substance of the people. And so as I invite you into a move of God's spirit, I'm not inviting you into a system or a plan. I'm inviting you to embody the life of Christ, cruciform living at your cubicle, in your family, in your neighborhood. And when you do it, and I do it, and she does it, and he does it, and he does it, and thousands of us do it. Now we are planting the city to come within the city that is, and it will bring the city to life. Would you stand your feet with me this morning? Amen. Question for you at every one of our locations. Personally, let's bring it personal. Do you know this new identity personally? Do you know this new identity for yourself? When you look into the recesses of your own heart, do you know salvation as a double wall of protection? Do you know the access that you have from your Father in heaven? Do you know peace from God? Jesus says in John 14, in an incredible passage, he doesn't just say, I give you peace. He says, I give you my peace. In other words, what he's saying is the perfect fellowship I have with the Father, that's what I give you. That's what I give you. And to live in anything less than that is to compromise the city of God on the earth. Do you know that peace? I want to talk to you today if you're not at peace with God. Every one of our locations right now here in New Haven, one-on-one, -on -one, you and God, are you at peace with your Creator? Do you know that He's forgiven your sins? Have you turned your heart over to Him? And if you haven't, it's time to do business with God. Right here, right now, it's time to turn your life over to Christ. See, God loves you so much that He actually came to rescue you. It is the hinge of history. God became a man. Now, it seems that this man who lived 33 years, never left his home country, never wrote a single book, was never on TV, it seems that this man should be long forgotten. And yet he's become the most famous man in history because he conquered death. And when he rose from the dead, he did what no man ever could or has done before. He conquered death to prove to you that what he taught was true, that he is the Word made flesh, that God became a man, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death so that in the judgment of heaven, the sin of my life could be completely forgiven based on the merits of his son. And when God in the flesh hung on the cross and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was abandoned by the Father so that you can never be abandoned by the Father again. And you're here today, you say, well, that sounds too good to be true. No, it's so good that it cannot not be true. It is, in fact, the truth your heart's been waiting for. But it's not enough just to know this mentally. You have to run in to the city and live there. You have to sell your old city, and you have to run into God's city. You have to throw away the city of man, all your self-salvation, trying to be a good person, trying to prove that you're good enough, trying to make your own way, trying to build your own plan or make your own rules. Friend, abandon that and run in full surrender into the city of God and you will find peace, you will find salvation, you will find access, and you will find eternal life. 
If you're here today and you've not experienced the peace of God like I'm describing, or maybe you have and you've walked away, now is your time to turn your life over to Jesus. At all of our locations, would you just bow your head for a moment out of reverence to God? Would you take this moment and bow your head and do some personal inventory? Am I right with God? Have I turned my life over to Jesus Christ? Have I placed my faith in his grace? And am I resting in his arms of salvation? And if you're not, and you say, Justin, today's my day. I want to take a step of faith. The scripture gives us a path. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, just a verbal confession, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if you're here today and you say, I need that salvation, well, then you need to take a step of faith. Would you take it today? If that's you, would you lift up your hand and say, that's me. I need to take that step of faith and turn my life over to Christ. Just keep it up just for a moment. That's me. I need to take that step of faith. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Anybody else say, that's me. Today's my day. I need to place my faith in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. And all of our campuses, just take a minute. If that's you, just lift up your hands. Thank you, Lord. I want to lead you in a prayer of surrender. Just a simple prayer. You can whisper this to God right now. Jesus, save me. Go ahead, Jesus, save me. I believe you died and rose again, and I give you my life. I surrender. Make me new. I believe in the cross and the resurrection. I receive new life. Look up at me just for a minute. I know there's many of us here that you would say, Justin, I've placed my faith in Christ. I believe in Jesus and in his grace. But if I'm honest, if I'm honest, I don't know that perfect peace that you're describing. If I'm honest, I'm not living like I have access to God. And if I'm honest, I don't experience this double wall salvation that gives me a deep sense of protection. I need the revelation of what I already believe. Well, the answer to how to do that, friend, is right in the verse. It says, he keeps the one in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. And so for the next couple of minutes at all of our locations, we are going to just behold the Lord. And I don't know what you came in needing today, but I know this, that if you will fix your eyes on Jesus, he will meet you now. Now. So it might be a healing in your body, a miracle in your finances, purpose for your future, clarity and direction, or just peace in your own soul, freedom from anxiety and fear. Whatever you need from the Lord now, would you stay your mind on him? Come on, let's pray together. God in heaven, you gave us a promise that said, if we fix our mind on you, You'll keep us in perfect peace because we trust in you. So right now, Jesus, meet us in this glorious moment where heaven and earth touch. Father, right now, 